Good. Thank you. Still didn't forget. Share the screen. And get to the PowerPoint. All right. Okay. All right. Well, again, welcome. We've got a fun hour ahead of us as we get to know each other some more um, on our trip. Um, I had lots of emails of folks that are out of town and whatnot. So uh, like I say, that's yeah. cool. I know that's going to happen some, but really excited you all could be here in person and, and Bill at home. Um, so just a few introductory stuff and then... Um, well, let's pray first, and then we'll do that. Gracious and loving God, thank you for a good Sunday, and thank you for your word, and thank you that we get to go to where your word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so let that, our anticipation grow, and our preparations be blessed by you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, remember... We're talking about the historical event of Jesus of Nazareth proclaimed with its significance, with that event's significance. Um, what we're going to do at this point is we're going to do a little bit of a mixer. Now, if you're in limited mobility, you can stay where you are and people will come to you. But you're going to have to stand up for this. And uh, when there's music playing, um, so um, we're going to do, we want you to find one person. I know it's a little scary, but don't trip over anything. Um, find one person that you, not your significant other or friend that you know. We're going to mix this up. So you need to find someone. And the first question you're going to answer is what is the place you're most anticipate? Say your name each time you in your group. You're most excited about seeing. And if you don't know, come up with one. <laughs> Some place that you're most excited about seeing while the music is playing. When the music stops, we're going to switch it. Okay. And this is the song. No, it's not. I went past it. <laughs> the city of Jerusalem. There it is. All right. They play this when you go down into Jerusalem. So, anyway, so go ahead. Find someone you don't know. What is the place you're most interested in? Oh, <laughs> Okay. Thank you. 
You got to know someone new today. Very cool. So, Bill, at home, and yes. Bonnie, our questions that we got to have fun with, and why don't we just have you, uh, if you don't mind, um, let's see, Greg, I'll put your phone is here, you can have that one. Um, what's the place you're most excited and what you're most, you most anticipate seeing? Is there a particular place you most anticipate seeing? <laughs> well, keep in mind that this is my first venture over there. Yeah. And it's going to be neat to be able to develop pictures for the names of the places that I visited because I'm well aware of them from the Bible, but uh, never, never having been there. But I, I suppose uh, a quick answer would be Masada. Uh, yeah. because although it's not mentioned per se in the Bible, it's a very famous and important mm -hmm. historical story. Uh, so that would be that would be good. But uh, curious about nice. all the other places that, that are on the map that where Jesus did this, Jesus did that. And uh, going to be interesting to find out if it's from deduction or if there's enough uh, other uh, cooperating evidence from other sources of this is precisely where it is, so it can be proved. You know, just to yeah. satisfy my own my own curiosity. But I'm looking forward to it. Uh, just hope we have good weather and uh, uh, incident less <laughs> type yeah. travels. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Bill. That was great. You got two of the questions. What you're most curious about is. Like uh, when they say Jesus did this here, is it just by deduction or or is there some other evidence for that? And and in some places there is, and in some place it is more like, well, it might not have been here, but it might have been 100 yards down the shore or something like that. But uh, yeah, no, that's great. I love it. Uh, Bonnie, are you there? Or no, did you... She's not on there. She's not on there. That's she, good. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, okay. So that was fun. We're going to have a lot of time. So every morning for breakfast, just getting your heads around this, I'm going to be, you're going to hear me say this a lot. We must be at the bus on time. Okay. <laughs> you're going to hear me say this a million times. And my biggest nightmare, other than 
uh, like I'm in high school football and I forgot the football game and I, you know, didn't go up to the game. That was my biggest nightmare. It happens. I don't know. Why. But my other biggest nightmare is that I'm the one that's late. So, <laughs> but you'll have time to eat a neat breakfast together. And, you know, some days you're not going to want to social. That's fine. There's no, this is, we're Lutherans, you know, there's no. But I do encourage you to look out for a different table and meet some other people and, and chat that way. That way is, is also when it comes to dinner. All right. Excellent. So with that, um, we will keep rolling. We're, remember, we're talking about um, roots, going to the roots. Let me hide this little control panel. So um, that is what's so powerful that I didn't realize would be so powerful um, when I went the first time is to actually put your feet on the ground where the story or the event happened. It's really cool. Here's our goals, remember? And again, you're going to have these all memorized by the time we go. Worship and hear the word where it began. Deepen and enrich our relationship with Christ. That's really what this is about. Um, connect scripture and events to geography. And that's, Bill, what you were alluding to. Um, and create and strengthen relationships together. So um, that's one of the greatest things that happens in these trips. And much more. So um, we're going to just a quick, quick review. Uh, we left off in Nazareth. And we're going to go see this little first century village that they reenacted. And like I say, the coolest thing about that is the, um, the mock synagogue that's modeled off of synagogues that have been, art, have been you know, art excavated and we know existed. And there's one in Magdala that we're going to see. Um, and it's a really cool replica. And then we're going to go out where you see Linda there with our guide Boaz. And that's the, our same guide that we're going to have on the Mount of Precipice, as it's called. Now, this goes to Bill, what you were asking, like, do we know for sure it was here? No, but this is a big cliff right by Nazareth. So, you know, and it doesn't really necessarily matter. But to, to go there and to read the story, which we're going to read now, um, in... Uh, uh, in Luke 4 is really, really cool. So um, if you have your Bible and you want to turn to Luke 4, and it's okay if you didn't bring it, but I encourage you to bring it in the future just because you're going to want to get used to, this will be good training. If you're going to use a tablet, if you're going to use your phone um, on the trip, I encourage you to bring it here and you can start practicing, opening it up, having it ready. If you're going to bring your big Bible and your backpack, great. That's fine. You can see Boaz has a big Bible that he um, has people read from. Now, I thought, I think we can pull this off, um, especially because we're a little bit larger group, that I know most of the places we stop and we do some of the readings, I'm going to see if I can't um, kind of pre-select. So you'll have time to spend you know really spend some time in that it may be possible it may not be um but uh and also see what translation he's using i don't know so um anyway that is there we go there's bonnie great good to see you bonnie um and so we're going to just look at that so this is luke 4 and this is the sermon that jesus spoke in that synagogue in nazareth um, and so I just want to read it, make a few comments, again, front loading, getting as much brain synapses all ready to go. So when you're there, it can really more can sink in and not just kind of bounce off. Um, so, gee, uh, in fact, anybody want to read? You can you read using the screen here or your own Bible. It doesn't matter which translation, please. Starting with verse 16. Yeah. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. I'm gonna slide it down a little. There you go. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So we'll pause right there. So 
couple things I want you to think about here, which are really impactful and amazing, and we could spend, you know, hours here on this text. Probably in the synagogue, they had a scroll of Isaiah, and so he finds the place. So he intentionally goes here to read this. And the thing that's often gone by me is what he says after it's done. But this is a perhaps a reference to the um, Jubilee year, but you've got the spirit. This is God's day coming. Proclaim liberty to the captives. Now, this word here, it's the only place in the New Testament where opposis is the way you say it in Greek, is translated as liberty. Everywhere else it's translated. Do you know what it's translated as? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. So what, it, it's a good translation because captives need to be set at liberty, right? But... If you think about it with the more of the sense of forgiven, why does a captive need to be forgiven? Unless what Jesus is thinking about, and I know we've got this in Greek, he spoke in Hebrew or Aramaic, but um, what Luke is telling us, using this word specifically, aren't we captive to sin? Okay, <laughs> so so powerful. So he speaks and he proclaims this. And then this is what really hits me. He rolled up the scroll, sat down, and the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. You're going to be sitting in a synagogue that would have looked just about exactly like that, what it looked like. And he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, wait a minute. Are the captives set free? What's different about the circumstances of the world at this point? Nothing other than that Jesus has spoke a word. When Jesus spoke, speaks a word, it is so. And so the kingdom of God, first and foremost, I'm not, this is not a, a type like only this, but the first, the kingdom of God is words. It's a message. It's the gospel. It's charisma. And Jesus said, it can be fulfilled because he spoke it. And so, yes. And it's, and then, you know, so that, that's just an amazing thing. And you're going to be there. You're going to hear that. And there's so much more we can do with this. I'm going to move us to the next story and we'll get more of your conversation here on this one. But note what happens here. And we're going to read this part. Um, after he says that, they speak well at the words. And then he picks a fight with them. <laughs> I mean, they speak well, and he says, doubtless, you're, quote, this position, heal yourself, which we heard you did in Capernaum, and, you know, Capernaum and that, not that far apart, we're going to be making that dry, uh, do here in your hometown, and he says, truly, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown, but in truth, I tell you, and then he talks about Elijah going to the um, widow of Zarephath, who was what? Was she a Jewish woman? No. She was a Syrian, I believe, but she is not a part of the chosen people outside. And then he talks about Naaman. And if you don't know the story of Naaman, Naaman was um, healed of leprosy. And he's a foreigner as well. So he proclaims the good news, says it's fulfilled in his preaching. See, so it's, it's, it's captives are set free. Then it's, tr it's happened. And he doesn't say it will be fulfilled. It says it is fulfilled. And then... He picks a fight with them by saying, you know what, you Jewish, lovely Jewish people, and Nazareth was very Jewish. We know this by excavations, and there are no pig bones there. <laughs> That's how we know it was a Jewish town. Now, just close by is Sephoris, which is more of a Greek town. So it's interesting, but Nazareth was a very Jewish town. It wasn't as impoverished as it had been thought in the last 30 years. Modern archaeology shows there was viticulture and, and uh, you know, fishing was, you know, the industry and processing fish, um, but lots of farming. And so it wasn't quite as impoverished as, as had been thought, but nonetheless, um, it's a Jewish town and he preaches and he says, okay, everybody's like happy. Oh, it's fulfilled. Isaiah's fulfilled. It's, it's going to include Gentiles. It's going to 
The embrace of this kingdom is not just for us in the, in the inner circle. And when they heard these things in the synagogue, they were all of a sudden filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought to the bow of the hill of which their town was built. And they're going to throw him off the cliff. And you're going to get to go to that cliff, maybe. <laughs> you're going to get to go to um, a spot that might have been the spot and hear about that. So that's just the end of our first day. And now we're going to move on to um, our next day, which we get to descend down into the Sea of Galilee. Um, and on that day, we've got um, Capernaum, just the area of Galilee in particular, and many of the stories, I don't have time, we're not going to cover all of them, but you'll know them, um, so you can read those stories if you haven't already, like Bill was talking about. Um, and then we're going to go to the Mount of Beatitudes. Again, a place that tradition says Jesus was overlooking the Sea of Galilee. We don't know for sure that's the exact spot, but it's in essence the backdrop of when he gave the uh, Sermon on the Mount. So let's let's do Capernaum here. Uh, show you a few pictures here. Um, this is where we've been, Nazareth. Now we're going to scoot over to Magdala. I'm sorry, to the Sea of Galilee. Um, and this is a picture of, I think, my first trip to the Sea of Galilee, standing next to it. And then in the back on the right is the church that's been built on the, um, um, where the Sermon on the Mount traditionally had been given. And it's a beautiful sanctuary. Maybe this is a good point for me to say something to you as Lutherans. Uh, most of us are Lutherans. Some are, we have a few Catholics and some others uh, traditions. But um, a lot of Catholic people or Orthodox people, depending on what the site is, they, they have invested in these spaces. And to come there is just, it's... Um, it's 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 powerful. It, it's it's almost like it's a sacrament, truthfully. Um, and us Lutherans go, we get a little nervous about that. We're going to get particularly nervous in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where people are bringing little items to rub on the wood piece of wood that Jesus was supposedly laid on. You know, so they get luck and all this stuff. And you're going to see this, and you're going, oh, that's a little weird. And then you're going to buy something and rub it on there. <laughs> But uh, so, but so, but we go there again because this we're getting our ground on where Jesus spoke these words, and uh, it is a beautiful church, and it's usually very quiet. People are in there praying. Um, I think you'll find it really amazing. But we will also have some time to worship, to sing, um, and to uh, hear the, the the beatitude. So, and we might have time today to, to look at that. So this is what Capernaum looks a little bit like today. They've estimated the houses, the places, and you see this structure on the right there. That's a weird looking place, isn't it? Well, uh, underneath that, that is a church. And usually you cannot go in there and I doubt we will be able to, but underneath there, and this is a picture of what's underneath, you see an octagon structure. And then inside that, you see a round structure. Um, why would they build a church over this place? Well, I think I'll just leave that hanging out there for a minute. Um, this is the, the synagogue that's actually the remains of a 5th century synagogue in Capernaum. However, 5th so century AD or before the, after the common era, um, the foundation for this, which you'll also get to see, is black basalt. And you would never build a beautiful synagogue like this on black basalt. It's just, it's round. It's, it's not a good foundation. Unless you wanted to build the new synagogue, or the old one was. And this is what they did. They, you know, like, if something happened to this church, we would rebuild it here. You know, in Lahaina. Imagine they're going to rebuild that church where it was, you know, um, in, in Maui. So, you know, this synagogue is, it's beautiful, it's cool, but it, it's way grander than what the first century would have been. In Magdala, you're going to see 
in particular what a first century synagogue looked like. But it does have the foundation. So it's here that Jesus uh, spoke in Capernaum. Um, and so now, here's the question. Was this where Peter was? Was this the home that Jesus stayed in? Well, let's, let's read Mark 2, uh, 1 through 2 here. Uh, let's stop the share here. Go back to Mark 2, 1 through 2. And I'll get another reader here. Anybody want to read? Thanks, Becky, please. It's from the New Living Translation. Go for so it. Yeah, that's okay. That's fine. We'll, we'll watch along as you read that one. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down. Keep going to the end of that story. Yeah. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he thinking? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, so he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stone on the All amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. Love it. Okay, so there's the story. It's one of the, it's one of my favorite stories. Um, it shows us who Jesus is. It shows us what he came to do. Um, and, of course, it also shows us why he got in trouble. Because, um, you know, it, in the world of critical biblical studies, uh, a lot of people hold that Jesus of Nazareth never claimed to be God or, you know, this type of thing. Um, <clears throat> this is this. And they say well, that's only in the Gospel of John. Well, here in the Gospel of Mark, it's a, basically the first big story. Um, he's doing something that only God can do. And he's accused of blasphemy. And he, said, he basically says, well, I'll prove it to you. And. The man gets up and walks and is set free, um, and forgiveness of sins are given. Um, so going back to the picture that you're going to get to see and be at, um, again, thank you, Bill, for setting us up here. <laughs> um, again, a lot of archaeology in this place. Capernaum's not that big. Uh, in fact, the synagogue, I could throw a rock over to where this location is. And um, so they've done a lot of excavations. And what they have proven is that this space soon, it, it was inhabited in the first century. There was a stove. It was a house like the, many of the other ones that they've excavated there um, and done archaeological research on. But after that, the walls were plastered, niches were made for candles so it could be lit up, stove was removed, um, and we see that this space began to change in its function. Now, why would they do that <laughs> um, for an ordinary space? And so, you know, again, I mean, there's always percentages. Is this the spot or is it... Um, you know, I suppose you don't know 100% sure, but this would probably be one at the top that they're very sure that this is the place spoken of in the Gospels, um, in the Synoptic Gospels, and here in this story in Mark. So why did they build a church over the top of it? What did they do? They opened a hole in the roof. That's right. <laughs> so the idea is to have the church above. And I guess you can go to that church and there's glass or something like that. But uh, um, so so that so when you go to Capernaum, it's really a cool place. It's called Jesus's hometown. You know? <laughs> um, and uh, tourists, you know, bit, lots of people go there every day. 
um, to see this spot that's right on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Um, and so it will bring to life some of you know what you hear and what you read, and I'm excited for you to do that. Are, is there anything in that story from Mark? I know I'd mentioned a few things, but just that jumped out at you um, as you read it this morning. Like, wow, I don't get that, or what about this, or yeah. So it would have been, would it have been obvious to his audience or not obvious that when he said your sins are forgiven, he's declaring I am God. Yeah. yeah. That's my understanding. Yeah. That wait a minute, you know, to forgiveness doesn't you can't stand in the place of God and announce forgiveness. That would be um that would be blasphemous in this setting. Now, maybe, I don't know if in the temple it might have been different with the sacrifices going on, but for him just to stand and proclaim that, yeah, yeah. They would have understood. You're saying you're God. Yes, yes. I believe that is correct. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes. And have you, anybody watching the chosen stuff, the chosen things? Really powerful uh telling of this story you know um, yes. really good they also have jesus's sermon in nazareth uh, i think that's in season three that's a really good thing. and that's a that's a good idea. that's a good uh um, and what i liked which actually i forgot to talk about is where jesus stopped man i know it's getting hot here so um uh the next verse in fact going back okay so switch rewind back to luke <laughs> Um, the next verse is, and declare the, the vengeance of our God. Well, Jesus stopped and he left that out. He stopped, declare the favorable year of the Lord. And he stopped right there. But after that, if you read on in Isaiah, and declare the vengeance of our God, which is what the people want, and Jesus stopped. And the chosen did a nice job. Like, why did you stop there, Jesus? You know. <laughs> so, um, and that's again, anchors the whole proclamation of God's forgiveness that includes everybody. Marianne, please. I, I just really appreciate in verse 5 when Jesus saw their faith. Mm. When they saw the man's friend's faith. Mm -hmm. Then that ignites forgiveness for him. Yes. Which feels such like good, like you said in your goals, like fellowship and community. That yes. Good, that good community building. Yeah. Wow. There's no way he could have gotten in there without his friends. Yeah. He's paralyzed. He's got, he can't do anything. Yeah. That's the whole point. Sometimes you gotta drag people. Yeah. <laughs> and dig a hole and drop them into the <laughs> That wasn't exactly where you were going, but I think. <laughs> Go for it. Love it. Oh, yes, that's right. No, I love that. Yeah, we need, we need, and the fact that the faith of those surrounding him was impactful. We get too individualistic sometimes. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. 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 There's a saying, right? When you don't have enough faith, often that your community has enough faith for you. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Please, go. Yeah. I just had a question because the last time we went, you emphasized that it was Peter's mother in law's house. Yes. Like, what verse was that? I don't remember. So, you just back up, I think, here in Mark. Thank you. You just, oops. Uh, yeah, back up in Mark. Let's see. Where is the mother in law? Is it before or after this? Um, Jesus after cleanses the leper. He heals his mother in law. Jesus preaches in Galilee. Oh, he says he like walks to the synagogue across the street. Yeah. 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 Chapter one, immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew, James and John. And like I say, when I've always read this in the past, I thought, oh, they walked like, you know, a half hour. You know, no, it's like from here to the other end of the, you know, this room here. So they just got out of the synagogue and walked over to the house. Um, and this is where he, um, Jesus healed um, Peter's mother. Yeah. So that's Mark 1. 129. Yeah. Yeah. And along with others. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Very good. Yeah. And the other really cool thing is that after he does these healings, everybody's excited. And, and Jesus is not around. And Simon Peter comes and says, everyone's looking for you. Come on back. 
He Jesus was off in a desolate place. I don't think that would have been when he left. And, Come on back, let's do some more. People love this. <laughs> this is a great show. There's no, yet, in essence, he doesn't say, get behind me, Satan, here, but he does say, I'm moving ahead to proclaim and preach. That's why I came. Um, uh, let's go on to the, that I may preach. Again, look at the connection there with the Gospel of Luke. That the kingdom of God comes in preaching and words. And, you know, how do you get an, you, um, we need each other to help us here and to believe with us and for us. Um, uh, just to reiterate what uh, Marietta said is like, that is the beauty of going together on this trip is, you know, when we're down, you know, someone else is up and we, you know, I, Sunday morning, you know, like some kids, I just don't know if I can come today. I don't know if I can last. I say, come and just sit there <laughs> or stand there and let everybody else wash you over with the words, you know. Um, so, yeah, I love that. I also, I also thought about just, um, especially pastoral ministries, if you got a couple other pastors here, I'm thinking about this event, but that's what we do as preachers, is just lay people before Jesus. And that's a cool thing. But we all do that because we're all preachers. So, cool. Other, other, uh, other things on this story that will sit with you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, shall we move on to one other spot? We're going to also look at where uh, fishes and loaves were multiplied on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. There's a traditional place for that. There's a place called Peter's Primacy, which is kind of fun and interesting for us to, uh, to wrestle with. Primacy at the Catholic Church, you know, Peter's primary. Um, and they believe that the priests and, the, you know, the Pope and the priests and the, the cardinals, bishops, priests, are kind of all in Jesus's line. And uh, Protestants, of course, say, no, Jesus founded his church on the preaching uh, that and the confession that Peter made. And so we have this lovely little dance that we do with that. Um, and um, Peter in the cathedral in Rome and in most places has a what in his hand? What does he have? Anybody been there to... The, you know, you Greece people should remember. What does Peter hold in his hand? In all the statues, he's got this in his hand. The key. The key. Yeah. He's got the key because he's got the keys to the kingdom because he's he's the guy. Paul has a sword, I think, for the word God. I mean, but people, so I think our guide says because that's the way he was for a martyr, but uh, I think it's the word of God, but but nonetheless, Peter's got the keys, and so the primacy of Peter, well, we look at that a little differently, but again, we're going to celebrate the events that happened in those places. So the other place we get to go on the, this day is to the Mount of Beatitudes, and so let me stop there and go over here, and we'll go on to that next spot. Great insights, everybody. Oh, I forgot, though. I think it's this day that we get to have a St. Peter's fish. <laughs> this isn't tilapia. This is a fish, the kind of fish. Now, I, if you're going to ask me now, are all these fish for sure from the Sea of Galilee? I'm, mine's my understanding, but I don't know. I'm not going to say. But we'll all get together, and we get to have this fish. Now, I know in the United States, most of the time we have fish, we don't have the head on it, all of that. But you want to get this fish if you like fish. I'm just telling you, it's really good. Um, French fries, all kinds of great um, Mediterranean salads, everything. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure that's still in existence. Uh, now that I think about it, I had some, but I got to show you this. <laughs> yeah, a few years back, she took care of that fish. Look at that. <laughs> and look at all the cool things there. Yeah, so I hope they're still going um, and they got through COVID okay, but I don't know that for sure. So this is the the church that's on the Mount of Beatitudes. Now you can see why it would make sense. It's just, it's up from Capernaum. It's it's on that uh, part, in the northern part of the Sea of Galilee, and it's a hill that kind of overlooks. And we're going to, I think we're going to get a, one of the spots down in here where there's a little amphitheater and whatnot where we can 
have some time to sit and read the story, read the Beatitudes and do have a worship service there. Um, so this is what it looks like from the air, and this is where you're going. So um, well, let's uh, let's just go back to the text and we'll take a quick look at the Beatitudes. Uh, how you doing there, Bill and Bonnie? Good. All right, excellent. All right, don't you guys just <laughs> jump in? Thought because sometimes I can't see you. I'm, I'm sharing the screen and I don't don't have you up there. Let's put you over here. There. We'll see that way if you jumped in. Okay. Um, so we're gonna go to Matthew. You got your Bible. Boy, we're getting all three synoptic gospels in here. Um, it is interesting how the chosen did the Sermon on the Mount. You know, they had this like they were preparing for months and months, you know, to, to deliver this great sermon. I, it could be. I don't know. We 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 don't get any of those details. And of course, the, the writer, by the way, and the director of he says it's not a translation. This is, you know, and so uh, I think that's important to to note. But uh, again, I I commend it. I'm I'm, you know, when it comes to Jesus movies, <laughs> it's it's doing pretty good. Uh, although we haven't got to the real crucial stuff yet. But anyway, so um, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. Okay, where has he been? Well, he's He's been ministering the great, you know, um, preaching um, um, in the ministry in Galilee here. So leaving Nazareth, he came to Capernaum by the sea, which is, a, again, uh, this is something we might talk some more about, how this fulfills some scripture in the Old Testament, just him going there. Um, he calls his disciples, he ministers to the crowds, and then he goes right up to teach. Jesus and Matthew is indeed a teacher um, and so what is he going to teach? He's a teacher preacher. <laughs> um, so, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. So there's a couple things, especially since this is the gospel of Matthew, that if you want to write or think about, or when you watch this again and you make some notes for yourself, uh, when you think about mountains, to us specific people, this is not going to look like a mountain to you, okay? We have a different definition of mountains. But when you think about what are some things, Matthew says it's on a mountain. Luke, by the way, has a lot of the content of this mission on the mountain on the plain. So different enough that I think he gave it like four or five or six times probably. You know, look, think about how many illustrations you've heard from me over the years, like three or four or five times. You, you're sick of them, aren't you? Anyway, okay, so you're not good. Um, so, but anyway, you don't remember. <laughs> More likely. So, you know, but Jesus preached a lot, and so he might have done it different. But Luke's <laughs> placement of that is really important. Matthew's is too. Mountains. Where do you think, if, if Matthew is a very Jewish gospel, what, what mountain do you think about right away? Old Testament. Sinai, Sinai right. Moses went up on the mountain, and God gave Moses... The tablets of stone, yeah. covenant, the uh, Ten Commandments, etc. So now Jesus goes up on this mountain. He went up on the mountain, and he went and sat down, and his disciples come to him. So a lot of people look at Jesus as Moses, like a new, better, greater Moses. I think there's some, you can make some case that that's, the, but actually it's more intense, just like in the Gospel of Mark, where he said, your sins are forgiven, and only God does that. Well, he goes up on the mountain, and who the disciples come up to him. And now he's going to speak. That seems to be putting himself in the place of God. You know, it'd be one thing for Jesus to go up and listen, but no, he doesn't go up and listen. He goes up and he gives the words. So that's intriguing to me. And then he opens his mouth and teaches them. So let's uh, let's have somebody read the Beatitudes today, and then we'll chat for a minute and finish up. Because like I say, I know it's warm. Um, anybody? Uh, I'm reading. This is the ESV. Also, there's nobody else. Kate, sure. sure. No, Kate. Oh, yeah, sorry. please. Yeah, oh, whatever you got. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. 
he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. <clears throat> Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Yeah, um, well, you can finish 12, yeah. Okay, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So this is the amazing start to um, the Beatitudes. Uh, I didn't pull it up ahead of time. Let's see, I don't think I have. Yeah, I didn't. Um, one of my New Testament professors has had a beautiful description of this you know, of what Jesus is doing here. But I want to focus in um, for the moment on just two things. The word blessed. Some of you have heard me talk about this before. The word in Greek is makarios. Um, let me get, let me just do a quick word study here, Bible word study. It's over here. There we go. Um, fortunate, happier, but it's all pretty much always trans. It should be translated as blessed, not so much happy. Um, and uh, there's some interesting things about this. Um, and you can see, you know, a lot right here in Matthew. Um, and it's in the same, Luke uses the same word as he, you know, translates this sermon into Greek. And remember that the New Testament is written in Greek, and Jesus spoke in Aramaic. Most people have always believed, which is a form of Hebrew, very similar to Hebrew. Although our guide, unless he's changed his mind, thinks that Jesus spoke in Hebrew, but a more of a Galilean dialect, that there was difference. Like, like a couple places in the Gospels, they say, well, you're a Galilean. How would they know that? Well, do we know if somebody's from South Carolina? No. Sure. And so, so that there might have been, he kind of feels like he probably that it would have made more way more sense for them to be speaking Hebrew, but of course, you know, he, anyway, um, that doesn't matter. But when the gospel writers are going to take this sermon Jesus preached and put it into Greek, they have to think about what word best translates things. And um, my systematics professor does a lot of work, did a lot of work at this, Ted Peters, on this um, uh, on uh, this word blessed. So we go back and um, this is Greek. And so in the, the whole world, and this is good background for you to, to, to know that the Holy Land, as we like to call, as I like to call it, what we know today is Israel, um, Palestine. Um, Alexander the Great, when he conquered, you know, 300 years before Christ or so, he brought Hellenistic, as we say, um, Greek thought all throughout the world. Um, that What did that mean? Who were the big Greek thinkers? Come on. Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, all these folks. Yeah. So, so much so that what I think anybody remember when the Greek Old Testament was produced? Is that 70 years before Christ? 70, somewhere in there. It's hot, I can't think anymore. But they translated the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. And abbreviation for that is LXX. It's called uh, the Pentateuch. No, Septuagint. Thank you, Septuagint. Boy, I'm really kind. It's called the Sep the um, Septuagint, and the the of course the the um, legend was that seventy scholars took the old the Hebrew scriptures that they had at the time and translated them to Greek without any collaboration, and it was exactly the same. <laughs> 
Probably didn't happen that way, but nonetheless, there's this Greek Old Testament. Why did they have to do a Greek Old Testament? Because people didn't know Hebrew anymore. We don't know Greek. We don't know Hebrew. So we need an English translation, don't we? Well, they did that. Um, and and uh, so people knew Greek very well. And also, by the way, you're going to hear a lot if you watch the History Channel, all this stuff that you know, only like 2% of the people could read or write. That's just, we're not seeing that to be true archaeologically. I mean, there's graffiti they find, and there's all kinds of stuff. People may not have been real literate, but they could read. Um, and uh, it's higher percentage than what most people think. But nonetheless, these gospel writers choose a word to say what Jesus said in this sermon. And they use the word makarios for this blessing. So here's the quick thing, because I know it's hot and we're, um, I'm evidently not able to think anymore. So <laughs> um, if you go to Plato and Aristotle, they talk about the concept of justice. That, you know, what, it, what do we want to do as human beings? We want to live a just life. And there's a reward for the just. If you live a just life, this is what they taught. After you die, you got to go to this beautiful island. It was wonderful. It was peace. There's full justice. This is the type of thing they taught. And you want to know what the name of that island is? Oh, Macarius, the island of the blessed. And so, Look what Jesus, Matthew, <laughs> does. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those people broken by their sin, by the sin of the world, by the heartache of the world, of injustice, et cetera. Those, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You mean not those who are perfectly just and who achieved this Makarios? No, blessed, it's, it's a gift. Blessed are those who mourn. Those people are blessed. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now that sounds a little bit more like, more like it, but um, they thirst for it. They might not even do it, but they thirst for it. And they're blessed. Blessed are the merciful. Um, blessed are the pure in heart. Um, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. So look at how the circumstances... Would we typically call those people blessed? I'm so blessed as I'm grieving. We typically just don't talk that way, do we? I'm so blessed I don't have a penny to buy a, anything. I'm so blessed that people think I'm an idiot, nuts, and persecute me because, you know, I made this stand or whatever. I'm so blessed um, uh, that people are, I'm writing and trying to be a peacemaker and everybody's shooting arrows at me. Um, we just don't think about that, um, that the meek are the blessed, but notice how Jesus flips everything around and he's, he declares it to be so. He doesn't say, um, blessed are you if you go out and mourn or something. Blessed are you if you go out and try and get persecuted. Blessed are you if you go, no, it's not, it's not an achievement. It's just a proclamation again. It's a preaching. And so that's that's just a really cool background to Matthews. Um, and there's also some interesting things when you look at what word it might have been in Aramaic or Hebrew too. So, but blessed, uh, truthfully, I, in fact, I think one of one of my um, Luther uh, professors that I really like uh, said just recently that in the Old Testament, the word Baruch, which is blessed, is really the gospel. That's that's the good news. You know, that's the good news word. Um, and so here Jesus starts off with the gospel, and you're going to be there or somewhere close. It's, a, it's, that. it's Please. an interesting perspective. I don't know about everybody else, but I've attended when people say, I'm so blessed, and you know, blah, blah. I get a not a, like an inner eye roll kind yes. of yeah. reaction. Yeah. And so it's kind of a yeah. way to look at right. it. You know, they're not going to roll with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but we do so when, when you say that do you mean like well something really good has happened no, so bad. when there's something bad news yes. yeah yeah you know like you're really being a positive here 
Deals. Way too, yeah. But now, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, New Living Translation, which translates all the Beatitudes instead of sort of this past tense into present tense. Um, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And then the next, God blesses those who, God blesses those who are, so it's it's more, it's not like. Interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. Blesses versus blessed. Yeah. God blesses you. Mm -hmm. So you're not, I don't know. I, I think, yeah, and especially if we keep retain this, that that it's not, it's not that, because we could go out and try and be poor, so we'd be blessed. <laughs> and that's not the point. See, the point is, blessing is given. Yeah. You know, so it's not an achievement. <laughs> right. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a proclamation it's, into our circumstances. So, yeah, no, good, good, good. Oh, please, Larry. I have a message here. Yeah, I, I found it interesting yeah. because you're blessed when you're at the end of your road. You're blessed when you feel the blessed with what's most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are. So the idea is, uh, am I poor in spirit? Yeah, maybe not. But it's like you're blessed, you're poor in spirit when you are. When you are, you're always sick. Yes, and it's going to happen to you. Yes, and when it does. You're blessed. You have the gospel. You are blessed. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Like it. Really good. And I love different translations to fill up the, the, the different meanings. And no, I love that. Love that. Eugene Peterson. You know, he uh finished his life at an ELCA church. He's pretty nice. That's where he found his his home, which is interesting. Um Love that. I, you know, what I do, it's like people ask me about translations. I say, get a literal translation, the NRSV, the ESV, the NIV, and then have the message. <laughs> Just as, a, you know, the message is not, it's a dynamic. It's not a literal translation, but in sometimes it will get it more right than the literal. So it's always good to have, have the, so. all right, cool. All right. Well, so we filling you up a little bit here. Getting excited, so you'll remember some of it when you're there. <laughs> All right. Any other thoughts, points? Let's let's get out of the warmth and out into the sun. <laughs> Gracious God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this each person who's going on this uh, journey back to the roots of our faith and. Uh, just continue to form us as a community that we already are in Christ. And so be with us until we meet again. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. All right. Bye. Hey, thanks, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Hi, Susan. Hey, Susan. <laughs> All Thank right. You. So we got. We got it. Thanks, Bill. We got it recorded. So whatever you missed, uh, you'll be able to access again online. So, all right. Very good. Stop.